Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NASCAR News Center studio. I'm your host, Jonathan Meerman, here with Kim Kuhn, and we're celebrating a very special day here at NASCAR. It is induction day for the 2018 Hall of Fame class, a class that is anchored by names like Red Byron, Ray Evernham, Ken Squire, Ron Hornaday Jr., and Robert Yates. A big day here in Charlotte, North Carolina at the NASCAR Hall of Fame, Kim. Yeah, and Jonathan, the thing I love about this class is they're so diverse. You're talking about a mix of drivers, crew chiefs, team engine owners slash engine builders, broadcast media members. So there's so much diversity that I think it really represents the sport as a whole. And then it's also just been fun to see people have started to trickle in behind us in their, their fancy outfits for the induction tonight. So it's just been fun to see everybody get excited about tonight's event. And it also means that it's kind of the official start of the 2018 NASCAR season when everyone comes out. We have media days coming up next week, but this is kind of the kickoff event to get everybody in the spirit. We put legends in the Hall of Fame and we get geared up for the 2018 season. I know everything is already starting. The gears are starting to roll. A lot of changes though for 2018. Um, and, and we're going to be talking about those changes specifically. And we also have time to answer fan questions. We are on Facebook Live. So if you have those questions, make sure you get those in. We'll make sure that uh, we try to get to every single one we can. It might be hard with the audience we have tonight, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it should be a good time. And again, so much diversity in this class. And um, I'm interested to see how that continues to progress. You know, we, we've seen a couple of guys retire recently that um, the names like Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, Dale Hart Jr., that it's going to be soon that we're calling their names as Hall of Fame inductees. And I think one of the biggest things, too, is that it is, you know, are they going to be first ballot Hall of Famers? That was a big topic last year is, you know, is a guy like Daryl Hart Jr. with 15 most popular driver awards but doesn't have that cup championship, is he a first ballot Hall of Famer? Well, the thing that a lot of people continue to reiterate is it's not just performance driven. Yes, we have the, the Hall of Famers that have the big numbers, but it's also about what you've done for the sport in general. And you, you talk about a guy like Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Jeff Gordon and, and Tony Stewart, and not only have we seen good on-track performances from them, but the things that they have done off the track for their sport, um, it, it's the Hall of Fame. It's not the Hall of Wins or Hall of Champions. So really that fame part and what the different things they were able to bring to the sport. And, and I think each th of those three were able to bring something unique. So we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, though, because tonight, again, we're honoring uh, a great group of five people that certainly deserve this honor. All right, let's let's uh, let's jump into kind of breaking down who's going to go in the Hall of Fame. I think one of my favorites of all time is Ken Squire. You talk about not what it's not about what people do on the track. Well, Ken was the voice for, for everyone, especially during that 79 Daytona 500 with the infamous fight. Richard Petty goes on to win that race, and they talk about how to, how to turn a race car into a 43-passenger school bus and all that. So it's cool to see Ken Squire and for everything that he's given back to the sport as a broadcaster, especially from our side of the mm -hmm. fence and where we sent him get into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to sound like a broken record, yeah. but I'm pretty partial to Ken Squire. First of all, he has such an iconic voice, and, and you mentioned that 1979 Daytona Tona 500, the first time we had flag to flag coverage, he coined the moniker the Great American Race, and then he talked about common men doing uncommon things, describing race car drivers. But then another favorite, and, and it, it's hard to pick a favorite because all five of the inductees have done so much for the sport, but Ray Evernham has had such an impact on the sport. You look at um, his time as a crew chief with Jeff Gordon, we're talking about three Premier Series championships in four years. Um, he definitely was kind of the innovator if we're talking about the Rainbow Warriors, the modern pit stop. I know we talk about a lot of times the Wood Brothers having kind of done that, but Really, Ray Evernham and that group kind of took it even further, and then he moved into a team ownership role, too, and then to the broadcast side. So he's done so many things that he's kind of a, a, a guy, a renaissance guy, a jack-of-all-trades. You look at the trickle-down effect there, too. He brought Steve Letarte and Chad Knauss into the sport, and those are two of the most successful crew chiefs. Chad's probably one of the most successful, at least in modern times. I think he probably is the most successful, what him and Jimmy have been able to do. And in those two guys, Chad and Jimmy, definite Hall of Famers in the future as well. So it's kind of cool to see you know, the footprint that some of these guys have left uh, on the sport. And Ron Hornaday is another one with what he's done in the truck series, I mean, he was the king of the truck series. When I was mm -hmm. growing up, I mean, you had to beat Ron Hornaday if you wanted to go out there and win a race. And when he was paired up with, uh, with KHI when that was still in business, Ron Hornaday was the guy to beat. And we talk about his success on the track. 
But what a fun guy off the track. If you ever get a chance to meet and talk with him, so many stories. He's a big personality, somebody that helped carry that sport and specifically that series. And when he comes to track still today, people stop him and, and want to hear the stories and all of the, the legacy that he's left for the truck series. He also used to, to house a lot of the, the up and coming yeah. talent. Jimmy Johnson <laughs> stayed on his couch, or he says they used to end up on the couch anyways. They were mm -hmm. offered a room, but they just ended up on the couch. So in terms of giving back, he was he's a huge part of, of kind of the landscape of NASCAR as we know it now. And then we talk about Red Byron. It's hard to talk NASCAR without mentioning him. And I think most NASCAR fans should know the name, but if they don't, the first sanctioned race he won and then won the first Strictly Stock championship title. So although we have to go way back in the history books, he's certainly a name that got etched very early. Well, if you're a newer NASCAR fan, it's worth looking up Red Byron, Raymond Parks, and Red Vote, and what they were able to do in the early days. I mean, talking about formalizing and putting together kind of a modern team as we know it. They had team cars, they had team mechanics. Everything was spick and span in Red Vote shop. Um, you can come here to the NASCAR Hall of Fame and kind of look at some of that stuff. And really kind of the innovation with what they had to work with was kind of off the charts. So Red Byron definitely deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. And then kind of rounding out the diversified group we have, Robert Yates, not only a team owner, but an engine builder. And some of the cars we still see on track today powered by Yates engines. So definitely had uh, kind of a, a keystone role in this sport and building it. Oh, absolutely. And you look at guys that, that drove for him, like uh, Dale Jarrett mm -hmm. and also Davey Allison, which a lot of people are very partial to. And, and, and people think think back to that 1992 mm -hmm. championship with Davey Allison mm -hmm. driving for Robert Yates and, and how close that was. And Alan Kowicki edged him out just a little bit there in one of the tightest races that we've seen for a championship yet. So Robert Yates deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, and uh, I'm interested to see what his family has to say tonight when they give the speech. You mentioned that 1992 championship with Davey Ellison, but they won the Daytona 500 right out of the gate that year. Um, so again, such an incredible class this season. I, you know, each year it's like, how do we top last year's class? And I think you can say, say the same thing next year. How are we going to top this group right here because again so diverse and they've added so much to this sport and really brought it where it is today all right we have a couple fan questions t uh, trickling in scott lowry do you think kevin harvick can win the 2018 daytona 500 Ooh, you know what i think he's got a good shot um it's so hard to pick a daytona 500 champion though because that race yes we see guys year after year that are good at it but we get super speedway races, and it's really anybody's race. Um, but I do think that we're going to see an uptick in, in Kevin Harvick's performance. This is the second year that Stuart Haas Racing is with Ford now. You know, last year, the beginning of the season, we saw them kind of go through some hiccups, and they didn't really turn up the wick until the second half of the season. So I definitely think they're going to be contender. Whether or not he'll be a, a Daytona 500 champion come 2018, I'm not sure. I think he may have a better shot than maybe some others in the rest of the field, solely of the fact that he is driving that Ford. And we know that, that Brad Keselowski in the later parts of last year kind of was complaining and lobbying with Ford and NASCAR to, to kind of get some help. But where they really stood out was at the super speedway races. Mm -hmm. If we look at Kurt Busch, who granted it was on gas mileage, but he still won the Daytona 500. Ricky Stenhouse won two restrictor plate races. Ryan and, Blaney was right there behind yeah, him. And, and Brad Keselowski, he ended up winning Talladega in the fall. So if, if this is a year for a Ford driver to go win that 500, I think this is the year with that Ford Fusion and the way that nose is shaped and everything. They just seem to cut through the air better at the super speedways. We'll see if that carries over for 2018. I'm also excited to see the new Chevy Camaro on track. Um, obviously, we saw a preview of that last season, but I want to see what it's going to do on track, um, specifically for some of the, the names like the Chase Elliott's and the younger guys, the William Byron's, really the Hendrick camp in general, as well as on the flip side, CGR is a team, a Chevy team I'm specifically looking at. All right, and as always, make sure you leave those comments. Here's something for you guys to ponder and leave comments about. Who is currently not in the NASCAR Hall of Fame that you think deserves to be in the NASCAR Hall of Fame? Or maybe it's a current driver that you think is going to end up having a Hall of Fame career. Me and Kim can kind of talk yeah. about that. Well, let's go to uh, Christian Allen. Um, who do you believe will be the 2018 champion? We were kind of bannering about yeah, we this were. back and forth earlier, so who do you think? You know, it's tough to say. It's hard to pick early, but I'm going to go with Martin Trucks Jr. having the repeat. I just think they were so strong. How do you not 
be that strong again this year. Like, he's got to drop off the face of the planet not to have another semi, even semi-successful year. And, and you think about all the pressure that was on that team last year. Everything. We all know what was going mm -hmm. on off the track with all of them and, and the burden of winning that title. And, and I feel like Martin Truex Jr. had something to prove. Mm -hmm. He's got nothing to prove now. All he's got is a desire to win, and I think that's a dangerous thing for the competition when that 78 team goes out there. They've done it once. They know how to work the stage racing formats and make sure they get those stage points and those playoff bonus points. So they've got it figured out, but I do think the new Camaro might be Jimmy Johnson and Chad Knauss' secret weapon, secret, secret weapon to go out there and win eight and put themselves in kind of that elite category. Mm -hmm. No other driver has won eight. Dale Inman has eight championships as a crew chief. I know Chad Knauss wants to tie that record. I know Jimmy mm -hmm. wants to break the King and uh, Dale Earnhardt's uh, record with, with seven titles. Talking sure. about future Hall of Famers, both Chad Knauss and Jimmy Johnson certainly fall in that category. I want to hit on Kyle Larson, too, as we're talking kind of um, championship contenders for 2018. Because if you look last season, what took him out of the championship run wasn't necessarily his fault. He had that engine failure in Kansas. Otherwise, I think we would have seen him contending for a championship down at Homestead, Miami. I had the chance to talk to Kyle a couple days ago, and just the irony of, of how his racing life has gone since you think about the, the second round of the playoffs, mm -hmm. or Kansas really mm -hmm. is really where everything turned around. And I was kind of messing with him a little bit. I'm like, the Chili Bowl, you're really going to blow a motor with 10 laps to go in the Chili Bowl? <laughs> and he just started laughing. He said hopefully he could shake that luck, mm -hmm. and hopefully he could kind of get over the hump a little bit. But... I mean, you look at the year that they had last year. I know they won that race at Richmond, which he had, hadn't won on a short track before, and that mm -hmm. was kind of due to a, a late race caution, and, and Denny Hamlin and Martin Truex Jr. getting together a little bit there kind of gave it to the 42. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you looked at some things that they were able to accomplish, and, and I think the mental game and just being able to finish races, he got that down pat kind of toward the end of, la at the end of last year. The DNFs really weren't his fault. So Kyle Larson going to be very, very dangerous this year. And also, I think Chase Elliott's going to have a, a pretty big year. Um, a lot of people are talking about Chase Elliott here in the chat. Uh, Malik wants to know, do you think Chase Elliott can be a seven-time champion? I think it's going to be hard to have a, another seven-time champion just, I'm gonna outside irritate, of Jimmy Johnson. I'm going to irritate fans. I'm going to say no yeah. simply because the way that the points mm -hmm. are now – it's, it's hard enough to, to win back-to-back. -back. You look at Jimmy, he won five back-to-back. -back. Mm -hmm. I don't think we'll ever see that again. I don't even know if we'll see another five-time champion. So the fact that Jimmy was able to get to seven in the modern era I think is absolutely mind-blowing, and I think he deserves to be in the conversation as, as one of the best NASCAR driver drivers or the best NASCAR driver ever mm -hmm. simply because of what they did and the different cars that they were able to run. But... And it's not a knock against Chase. I think Chase is due. I think Chase could be a multiple-time champion. He, we mm -hmm. know he's got the talent to do it. But just with the way everything's set up right now, I don't think we'll see another person get to five. I, yeah, that's what I think, too. I think you're going to be hard-pressed to even find that five-time champion. And, and that's taking the entire pool, the Kyle Bushes of the world, the Kevin Harvicks who already have championships under their belt. Um, I do think, though, we're going to finally see Chase get a Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series win this season. He was so close last season. Um, I think he's gotten to a point where he – he doesn't get in his own way, and it's just extraneous things that are keeping him from victory lane, and I certainly think we're going to see him win this season. Here's an interesting question, because I'm getting a lot of questions about Hendrick drivers. Mm -hmm. Alex Bowman, William Byron, or Chase Elliott, who wins first? Ooh, you know my take on this. I know your take. I'm going to actually say William Byron. Um, only because his progression has been so swift and every single year. You know, you, you look back to 2015, he won the K&M Pro Series East Championship. He's six years yeah. in a full-body stock car and he's winning championships. Yeah, he jumped to the Truck Series, won seven races, should have been contending for a championship. I remember had that engine blow in Phoenix. Then he moves up to the Xfinity Series. Everybody's like, ah, it's too soon, it's too soon. He wins the Xfinity Series. Now he's moving into a cup ride. I think his adaptability is top-notch, cream of the crop. And I think, actually, we're going to see him probably win before Chase Elliott or Alex Bowman. You were, tell, him, tell him your pick. You are Dax Bush's hero because he wants <laughs> to know if, if, if William will win a race in his rookie season. So Kim thinks yes. I think yes. I think Alex Bowman wins a race in the first ten races of the year. 
Explain why. I have, well, Phoenix, he's phenomenal at Phoenix. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and Richmond, I have those two tracks circled. I think he's kind of, Junior Nation's not overlooking him, even though no. I think a lot of those guys are going to focus their attention and their fandom on Chase Elliott, and that's understandable. But I just think Alex Bowman might be a little bit under the radar. If okay. you look at his statistics in that 88 car, even though the results might not show it, which, I mean, Phoenix was a phenomenal race mm -hmm. for him, but I just feel like he learned and he got better. And he's smart, and I think he'll listen to Greg Ives, and I think he'll kind of watch what everyone else is doing around him, kind of, you know, really a cerebral type of guy that's, that's going to, you know, he'll put it on the line when he has to, but I think he's going to sit back, he's going to learn a little bit, but I think Phoenix and Richmond, he's got a good shot at winning. All right, we'll have to wait and see. What, do you want to hedge our bets? Do you want to take a bet now? Not on camera. I think that's okay. Illegal. We'll do, we'll do it off camera. <laughs> well, we'll have to fly out to Vegas. <laughs> All right. Uh, so John Edwards Kruger wants to know that your thoughts on the new era at HMS Hendrick Motorsports getting a lot of love on the Facebook. They are. Today. I think it's a it's a good era. It's a new era. It's young. Um, and uh, I'm interested to see how Jimmy Johnson's role not necessarily changes, but how it's going to be for him having three very young teammates. Um, and they, we saw some jokes throughout last season. I know after a team meeting, um, Jimmy had tweeted uh, a picture of Alex Bowman and, and William Byron in his in, in, his, car, in seats. car seats in the back of his car. Um, I do. I would like to see them come out stronger than we saw last season, for sure. I think they're set up well for the future. I think if you look at, at the way that Rick Hendrick has positioned himself, mm -hmm. if you look at the way uh, like Coach Gibbs has positioned himself and Roger Penske has has positioned himself, those three teams are very young. I mean, I think a lot of people look at Brad and think that he's been around forever and Joey mm -hmm. and that he's been around forever, and, and they have, but they just started young. Yeah. And, and, you know, each of those guys has five or ten years left on their career. And, and Joe Gibbs Racing, you know, Kyle Busch isn't done. You have Daniel Suarez there. Denny's still a young mm -hmm. guy. And you have Eric Jones who's moving over there too. So this is kind of a new era for NASCAR in terms of just a huge crop of young, talented drivers. And one thing that kind of stands out to me, is I think that the playoff is going to look completely different this okay. year. If you look at you know the number of veterans who have been in there the, the past couple of years <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and the sheer number of talented young guys coming in, I think there's going to be a huge shakeup at the end of the year because some of these young guys who maybe have won one or two races or haven't won any at all, they're mm -hmm. going to get their due before the cutoff in Indianapolis. We saw a number of first-time winners last season in the Cup Series, Austin Dillon, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., Ryan Blaney. How many do you think we'll see this year? Because obviously you have a good crop that don't have a win yet. We're talking about – Chase's you know, due. Chase's due, the Ty Dillons of the world, Eric Jones, Daniel Suarez, William Byron. We mentioned Alex Bowman. I think four is a Bubba solid Bubba Wallace number. moving into the Cup Series. You think four? I think four is probably a conservative number. Okay. I mean, Chase – you know Chase has, has got to win. Daniel Suarez. And I, I mean, had already said William Byron, so there's three right there. He's, that guy keeps getting better and better, and Eric Jones keeps getting better and better. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to come down to opportunities at the end of the race. It's just who can put themselves in position. So, and, you know, there's it's just there's a lot that, that we're going to see throughout this season that is going to shock people, but we're going to have to sit back and think, well, you know, they've been coming up through the ranks for a couple of years, so this isn't going to be surprising to see some of these young guys get out there and win. And I think that they'll take more risks than maybe some of the veterans will. Um, it's early in their career. You know, if they, if they don't, you know, win this race or that race, it's not the end-all, be-all because they have so much time ahead of them where you talk about some of the guys that are maybe nearing the end of their career, maybe wanting a little too much to get those last few wins of their career. Speaking of risky... Okay. We have a little bit of a schedule change Ooh. in the playoff. A little shakeup. So Indianapolis is going to open up the first round. We're going to going to close out the regular season, mm -hmm. and then we have Charlotte is a cutoff race mm -hmm. in the playoff, and Richmond, which is a short track, is also in yep. the playoff. Yep. And let's throw Las Vegas in there as well because they, they got a second off. date. They kick so, off the playoffs. I mean, that's that's completely different way to open up that first round so or first and second round mm -hmm. so I mean there's a lot of difference there but let's focus on that road course um, someone in the chat let me see let me go back and find it here Douglas McDonnie wants to know who do you think will win win the Charlotte road course race in the playoffs and do you think it'll be a playoff driver let's let's make it a two-parter that's interesting um, I can't 
specifically pick one person that's going to necessarily win it because I think we're going to see a lot of the drivers that are strong at Sonoma and Watkins Glen be strong at Charlotte. Um, that road course, but I think there might be some names in there that typically you wouldn't pick as a road course guy that might just get kind of the rhythm of the Charlotte road course. It was interesting though, they tested um, back in October, I think, and um, we had talked about this that Martin Truex Jr., after the test, had likened this race to Talladega in its uncertainty and its kind of wild cardness, and that falls at the very end of that round. And he said, I want to win one of the first two races of that round, so I don't have to sweat going through Charlotte because it was that unpredictable, um, that challenging. So it's hard for me to pick one driver and say, yep, they're going to take home the trophy there. I think you're going to have to survive. I also think that a big part of it is going to have to be the crew chief. You're mm -hmm. set up for that racetrack. You're still racing on, on the high banks. Yep. And, I mean, you're really going to have to nail that setup. So it, it's, a, it's a completely different beast than any other road course that we go to. So I think we have a, a special guest getting ready to come in. Well, you have a uh, guest. We do have a guest, but before we get to that guest, mm -hmm. we're going to roll the Daytona Day preview and let everyone get amped up for the Daytona 500. What's up, bud? How are, How are you? Good to see, Good to see you. you. How about Eric Jones in the 77th? The team hadn't given up. They've worked together to get this car in the position. There you go. Nice work. Perfect. You know you like wearing your hat, sir. You know, if you stick that all the way in your ear. All right. So while, while Daryl gets wired up, we're going to uh, keep talking a little bit now. We were talking a little bit about the Masters and the green like jacket. The looks of the of the and, uh, I'm at age 21 here years old and leading sporting something uh, pretty nice as well. He's got a blue coat the on. Blue, the blue yeah. jacket. He's, he's got, a, a, got a nice we ring on that finger. Yeah, got one of our big goals got this year was to get rookie yeah. of the year. So. So. Got your Hall of Fame jacket, got your Hall of Fame ring, and uh, I guess that means you're in the Hall of Fame. To take us back to that moment, you were part of the 2012 class, getting the jacket, getting the ring, and having your name announced. What was that moment like? Well, it, it, you have a lot of flashbacks. You think about, uh, first of all, you think about all the people that are on the committee. And there are 50 people. And a lot of them you know well, and they know you well, and some of them like you, and some of them don't, you know. I mean, you've competed against them, so you might be rub fenders with some of them or rub some of them the wrong way. So it, it, it makes you feel good to know that your peers, the people that have watched you through your career, I uh, think that you're a, a, hall of a Hall of Fame worthy candidate. And uh, so those things go through your mind and you're, you're grateful uh, for them putting you in the hall the way they did. And then, and then, and then just your career in general. Uh, all the things that, uh, that, that you've kind of forgotten about, mm -hmm. people remind you of. You know, whether it's a win somewhere or uh, maybe it was a, a late model sportsman race or maybe it's an ASA race or maybe it's an ARCA race or maybe it's a modified race. And you don't really put them all together until you're standing there on stage at night and you say, boy, the sum of all these parts, you know, it adds up to a pretty good career. Uh -huh. yeah. Let's let's talk about a, uh, about someone you competed against fiercely with. That's Robert Gates. He got yeah, yeah. to he got to learn about his induction into the Hall of Fame earlier this year. Obviously, he passed at the end of last year. But but what did this mean to Robert to know that this was coming and that his legacy would be cemented forever in these walls behind us? Yeah, I, of course we didn't. You know, we haven't had a NASCAR Hall of Fame for a, a very short period of time. So I, I think most of us uh, uh, we are you're in other Hall of Fames. Uh, but there's no Hall of Fame like the NASCAR Hall of Fame, and that's something we all, always thought we needed. Something was that that is for NASCAR drivers and NASCAR uh, mechanics and crew chiefs and car owners. And, and I know for Robert, I'm sure Robert was just like the rest of us. He probably never thought about someday I might be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, but I do think that it was important to him uh, when he was nominated that uh, he might be one of the final one of the final five because uh, Robert's done a lot. He'd accomplished a lot. Won a lot of uh, races, uh, was a winning car owner championship, and so uh, I, I think it was real special to him. Under the circumstances, I know he, I, I know he would have loved to have been here tonight, and I know his family is uh, probably going to be pretty emotional. It's hard to come down here tonight and celebrate the life of Robert Yates and Robert not to be here. But I worked side by side with Robert. We were he was at Junior Johnson's, and I stole him away from Junior. And he came to work for Diegard, and we worked together at Diegard for a period of time. Uh, and so Robert's been a dear friend of mine, Doug, Carolyn, the whole family's just been good friends of mine. And it, it's, a, it's really gratifying to know that he knew uh, that he got inducted into the Hall of Fame. 
Jonathan and I were talking about the diversity of this class. You're talking Carner slash engine builders, drivers, crew chiefs, broadcast media members. For you, though, for these five members, is there one thing that they all have in common that they all brought to the sport? Well, they all love the sport. Uh, I think that's 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 a probably a number one criteria. You know, you you they're life they're lifers. Mm -hmm. They've been at their whole life, and uh, they're dedicated their whole life to the sport. They've contributed. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, Ken Squire. Ken Squire is one of the few people that he, when he starts describing something, I feel like I'm there. I don't. I, he he paints this beautiful picture with words that makes me feel like I'm driving that car. <laughs> I'm in that race. I'm, I, 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 it just is a feeling that uh, that Ken can can communicate that not a lot of people can. And and of course, you know, our, our Ron Horner Day was a friend of mine. Uh, he, we raced trucks together. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, I had a truck team for a period of time. We competed against him. And uh, Red Byron, uh, our first champion. Uh, it's, just, it's just these guys all. Ray Everham. I knew Ray from the IROC days. I met Ray when he was working for uh, Jay Signori in the IROC cars and Roger Penske. I tell, Jay all, or I tell uh, uh, Ray all the time, the reason you're so detail-oriented is because that's the way Roger Penske was. Mm -hmm. And that was part of being a Penske guy. You had to you had to pay attention to detail, and uh, so I think that's what made Ray so great. And uh, of course, we've already talked about Robert and what a great engine man he was, and what a great listen. Robert Yates wasn't just a great racer, wasn't a great engine man. He was a great person. Mm -hmm. He loved the Lord, and he had a great heart, and he was kind, and he was gentle, and he was considerate. Uh, Robert Yates was a great guy, and I, I'm so glad I I got to be his friend for a while. Now, DW, we are on Facebook Live, so that means oh, really? that we yes. have an opportunity for the fans to ask you some questions. So I have a couple questions here. The first one coming from Warwick. He said, DW, what are you most looking forward to this season? Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward. You know, every every year or two or so, we have maybe one or two rookies that we kind of keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. This year, it's not just rookies, but it's young guys. I think there maybe are 10 10 really bona fide young men that could win races this year. Uh, and they're all in good equipment, they're all in good cars, and, uh, and we're just at a transition. And, and people say, well, I, I, I'm not gonna follow this sport anymore. My favorite driver retired. Listen, I remember in the 70s uh, when Richard and Buddy and Kale and Benny and Bobby and that, and, and that whole crowd, that was the establishment. And, and, and so who's going to take their place? Well, here came me and Dale and Bill, uh, Bill Elliott, Rusty, Terry Labonte, another young bunch of guys, and we were able to fill those shoes. And now here we are time, a little bit later on. We retired, and here came Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Johnson and Tony Stewart and Kevin Harvick. And here we are again. Uh -huh. It's about a 10-year <laughs> cycle. About every 10 years we go through a changing of the guard. This year it's more, I think, apparent and more obvious. And one of the things I'm excited to watch is old guys versus young guys because these young guys have got a lot to learn, but they got a lot of talent and they're in good cars and they're going to have an opportunity to show what they can do. But every 10 years we have a changing of the guard, so to speak. This year more than ever because there's so many of them that we, uh, that we kind of overwhelmed, I think, to a, little de to a degree. But it'll be fun to follow these kids and see how they progress. Christian Allen Kidd wants to know who's your pick for the 500. Ooh, Ooh, good question. You know, it's hard. That's probably one of the hardest races there is to say who's going to win it. Uh, would I have picked Kurt Busch to win it last year? No, probably not. <laughs> uh, you know, thinking back, would it, maybe would I have picked uh, uh, Ryan Newman to win it a couple of three years ago? Or there's just, mm -hmm. it's hard to know who's going to win that race. It's so unpredictable. Anything can happen. You got to go with the favorites, the guys that you expect to be up front. I expect Truex will be tough. I think, I think the Toyotas, that's going to be interesting to see if Chevy and Ford can match the speed of the Toyotas. They were pretty strong down there the last couple of years. Uh, Kevin Harvick will be good. Uh, you know, and then we got, I, I tell you, that I think a guy that will surprise a lot of people is, uh, is Paul Menard in that 21 car. Because that 21 car is bad fast. Mm -hmm. He had a shot at winning the 500 this past year. So he'll be good. Uh, Almirola in the 40, in the, uh, in the 10 car. Mm -hmm. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how Bubba does in, in Richard's car and in the, in the, in the uh, King's car. So, got a lot of really cool storylines going into Daytona. One more fan question for you. It says, Stephen Martin says, Hey, DW, what's your favorite thing about calling a race? I, I, you know, I, I go home after a race and I tell my wife I'm exhausted. And she'll say, You're exhausted? Why? You just stood up there and talked about <laughs> Man, I had to drive all 40 cars. I mean, it, it literally, I, tell, I told Jeff Gordon when he came up here with us, I said, you're going to see, see things that you've never seen before. 
You've been in the car. You've been looking out that windshield. You've been in the action. Now you're going to step back. You're on the other side of the fence, and you're going to see it all. Mm -hmm. Not only are you going to see what's going on up here with these guys in the front, and they look like they're going to wreck every lap, there's other guys in the field back through here that will scare the heck out of you making the moves that they make that you don't see because you're driving your car. But when you're up here, you see it all. And uh, I, I think that's the, that's the fun thing about it is you get to see the whole race, mm -hmm. the, whole, the, the, the track, the cars, and, and, and you're in the best seat in the house. And, uh, and I love the sport. I always have. I love being a part of it. And uh, I always like to communicate to the fans at home what I see, what I feel, what I think. And uh, it's been a great career for me. Driving was fun, but TV's right in there with it. <laughs> well, Daryl, we appreciate your time. Kim, we appreciate you as well. Yep. And remember to make sure to watch the NASCAR Hall of Fame 2018 inductee ceremony tonight at 8 p.m. on NBCSN.